I want to open in prayer tonight, um, really set the tone for the evening. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the fact that you have loved us, you still love us, and you will always love us. Lord, you have given your life for us. And Lord, we pray that tonight our eyes will be opened, our ears will be opened to hear the things of God, and that, Lord, you would bless every single thing that happens. I pray that you would literally pour your presence out in this place so that it would be a, a time not of, of grief and sorrow over statistics alone, but, Lord, there'd be a time of reflecting on hope, the hope that comes with Jesus Christ. And, Lord, I pray that you'll bless this evening, that everything we do would bring praise and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our goal tonight really is just to allow you to experience what's on Kayla's heart. And I want to start by introducing Stephen Osorio. He's a part of City of Grace. <laughs> and he's going to, he's gonna to open our evening and really kind of set the tone for what we're talking about. How's it going? Yeah. All right, so every time I've uh, done this at home, I start to cry, so. <clears throat> I'm gonna try and get through it without it, but if you start to cry, just like cover your face because it'll probably make me cry even more. Uh, sex slavery is like, uh, it's been put on my heart by God as well. And, you know, when Kevin told me about this, it wasn't even an opportunity of if I was gonna do it. Um, you know, I, I feel like this is one of the reasons God has put me on this earth is to really fight this battle and, um, try to protect as many souls as possible. Um, this piece is called Their Voice. I'm just gonna start. What if I told you there were more slaves now than ever before? What if I told you there were a few slaves about 20 miles from that front door? What if I told you that selling people for sex and labor was a $32 billion business? And that more than half of that $32 billion was made off of innocent children? What if I told you in three years, slavery will surpass the drug trade? And if you wanted to buy a slave, the 90 bucks is all you probably would have to pay. What if I told you there were more slaves than there are people in South Dakota, in North Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, New Mexico, Vermont, Connecticut, Delaware, Nevada, Utah, Arkansas, Idaho, and Kansas, all combined? Now, I don't want to add anything else to that. Just let that sink in. Really think about that for a moment. Fact is, there are 27 million slaves, which means 27 million people without a choice. 27 million people without a voice that's being heard. You see, every word that they speak is silence because any protest to this unrest is met with brutal violence. Being so weak, there is no strength to even lift their eyelids. Defeated, left meek, so obsolete. These victims eventually hollow out and get used to their climate. Money grows on trees, so I guess it leaves no room for kindness, a slave life. One shower a week, one meal a day to eat, zero friends, no family, no voice, no rest, no breaks, 10 to 20 sexual visits a day, rough. where you're stuffed under beds and hid from the police, not because of the fear of being freed, but the fear that the police will want their cut. 
rough. You see, there's a big problem, a big problem that will only continue to get worse, like it's estimated that another one million new children will become victims of trafficking, like that worse. Like it's estimated that 99% of victims are still not free, 99%. That worse. Like, it's estimated that 50 to 60% of children who are trafficked into sexual slavery are under the age of 16 years old. Doesn't that hurt? 27 million slaves. $32 billion in dirty money. One million new child slaves 99% of victims are not freed, and that is a pity. Missing, abused, trapped children right here in our own cities. Who will be their voice? Someone's gotta stand up, someone's gotta speak out. My people, there's a need for a rising. Because boys and girls as young as four and five years old are being sold by their own mothers. Now I know if that was my sister or my brother, I have my sleeves rolled up ready for action. So it got me asking, wasn't it he who said, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brothers in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God, God's love abide in him? You see, I've learned that through him, anything is possible. Together, our voices and our actions are unstoppable. You all are the voice. And it's logical to think that the knot that's sitting in your abdominal is just the fuel you use to help power a change that'll exceed the phenomenal. You are the voice and the action is what you need to take because instead of rape, a six-year-old girl should be blowing out the candles on her birthday cake. Instead of hate, these souls should not have to wait for love. You are the voice, so please speak up. Help bring out an awareness that will truly impact and truly matter because I heard that money talks and with 32 billion, that's a lot of chatter. So let's devote our time to fight the chit chat. These victims need more than a break, no Kit Kat. You are the voice. 27 million is 27 million reasons that we will never ever give up. Do it all. You learned all these stats, but I ask you one question. How loud are you willing to speak up? Because you have a voice and it's their voice. Thank you guys. night for me and um, it means a lot to me and I want to thank Stephen Osorio because it's obvious that God has given him an ability to with words that most people don't have um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit, little bit about what I'm doing um, where I'm going things like that and then share a little bit from my heart so I'll be leaving on January 20th, I mean January 3rd, 2012 for Bangkok, Thailand. And it's a long 36 hour journey. And my mom offered to come with me like my parents did when I went to college. But even though I still may look like I'm 18, I'll be 24 then and I wanna do it by myself. <laughs> um, so I'll be moving to Bangkok for initial six months. Um, and there I'll be t attending a children at risk program at YWAM Bangkok. And the children at risk program begins with three months of intense discipleship, language school, and then specific training and issues related to um, children at risk. And I'll also be involved at that time in regular ministry in Bangkok. And then at the end of the children at risk training um, for about three months, I'll be involved in intense ministry opportunity in the prevention, rescue, and restoration 
of children at risk and their families in a country that I will find out when I get there. <laughs> Surprise. Um, so I know I'm called to ministry, and I know I'm called to the missional life serving children at risk. And so as a part of this life journey, I founded Lionheart 117. Um, Lionheart 117 is a nonprofit corporation in the state of Arizona. And Lionheart 117 exists to prevent, rescue, and restore children and families at risk by providing services that, which empower, strengthen um, orphans and vulnerable children and families. And initially, um, Lionheart will focus on children trapped in sex slavery, but I know that as the years go by, um, it's just going to expand. And my goal in all of it is to um, glorify God through fighting injustice. And the name Lionheart comes from the life of David. And um, we understand that David had a tender heart and an intimate heart toward God and toward people, yet he still maintained a lion heart for, his, for the injustice, injustices of his people. And 117 is taken from Isaiah 117, which says, learn to do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the cause of orphans, and fight for the rights of widows. And as a believer, in the saving power of Jesus Christ, I can personally find nothing more important than to seek justice for those who are hurting and to help people who are oppressed by the ungodliness and to defend orphans who are fatherless and without a voice and to fight for widows who have no one but God to protect them. And I believe that the Bible teaches us that this is true religion. And when I think about any other life, not doing what God has called me to do, I see a life without meaning, meaning without direction, and without call. You know, I may never own a mansion in North Scottsdale or plot and plan my 401k or investments, but I know that I will daily feel the tug of another child's heart and a heart that cries for freedom. And the Bible is filled with stories of remarkable women who made the choice to lay their lives down on the line. There's a story of Esther and the story of the Hebrew midwives. And we all know the story of Esther. And she was orphaned as a Jewish woman, chosen without her consent to be the bride and um, queen of, for the king of Persia. And the cousin who raised her uncovered the plot, which would have resulted in the death of all Israel, I mean all Jewish people. And Queen Esther risked everything, including her life, to save her people by going uninvited before the king to plead for them. And she knew it was her destiny. And Exodus tells us the story of the Hebrew midwives. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on a delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. But the midwives feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do, and they let the boys live. And I know I can say, like Esther, that I have been brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. And I will intercede and intervene for the people. And I will be like the Hebrew midwives, and I will fear God and not man. And I want to make a promise to you that Paul did when he um, spoke to the people of Philippi. And he said, but it was good that you helped me when I needed it. You Philippians remember when I first preached the good news there. When I left Macedonia, you were the only church that gave me help. Several times you sent me things I needed when I was in Thessalonica. Really, it is not that I want to receive gifts from you, but I want you to have the good that comes from giving. And now I have everything and more. I have all I need because Epaphrodites brought your gift to me. It was like a sweet-smelling sacrifice offered to God, who accepts that sacrifice and is pleased with it. And my God will supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And Paul made this prophetic promise to the people of Philippi that God would supply all their needs. And we have to ask why. And I think it's because they had, helped him, they had helped him when he needed it. When he left Macedonia, they were the only church that gave him help. 
and many times they sent him things he needed when he was in Thessalonica. He had all he needed because of the gifts that were brought to him. And their gifts were like a sweet-smelling sacrifice offered to God. And they accepted the sacrifice. He accepted the sacrifice and was pleased with it. And tonight, I want to make you this prophetic promise: as you help meet my needs, it will be like a sweet-smelling sacrifice to God. He will accept this sacrifice and he will be pleased with it. And I know that my God will supply all your needs according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And as I close tonight, I'm just going to tell you um, kind of the story of how I got here. This might be the part that I cry. <laughs> um, so it was in the beginning of 2009. I was a sophomore at Vanguard University getting my BA in psychology and minor in religion. And I had already planned out what my rural family quiet life would look like not knowing that God was going to call me to do otherwise and ignite my heart with a passion for his children. What I thought was an ordinary Sunday night at church changed the course of my life. That night, God spoke to me and directly said, I've called you to the ends of the earth. Your place is not at home. It was a night that I wouldn't tell anyone about for another two years. I was too afraid of what the missional life would look like. A life full of unknowns, un miles in, away from my family and friends, and drastically different from the comfortable life I had been living and planning. I knew that this calling was from God, and I knew that with my willingness and obedience, it would one day come to pass. And that summer, I, um, in 2009, I had the amazing opportunity to travel to Ethiopia. You probably saw some of the pictures. Um, I was there for four weeks on a missions trip. And there are many times there that I began um, picturing myself being a long-term missionary. And while God's calling grew stronger in Ethiopia, um, my own idea of what was best for me took precedence. And I remember explaining to God that I wasn't going to go alone, that if he wanted me to go, then he would have to provide a husband for me to do this. Um, <laughs> And we, would, and we would go together. But there was, I just, there was no way I was going to do it by myself. And that's what I said. I, like, I don't know. <laughs> On the way back to California from Ethiopia, um, we had a two-day stop in Frankfurt, Germany. And um, our hostel just so happened to be behind the red light district there. And um, that night... I was having a hard time falling asleep, so I got up and sat in the window sill. And my mind and emotions were taken over by the constant stream of shadows walking up and down a staircase. A staircase that led to several rooms with red light stream from the windows. Seeing firsthand the injustices of the world and the effects of sin, I knew I could no longer live a normal life and comfortable life when God's children are suffering around the world. That night, I made a promise to God and to boys and girls around the world that I would do something. In the fall of 2009, I woke up from a dream, and in that dream, I was visiting some girls that I had come to know that were trapped in sex slavery, and they were living in a brothel in a village built on stilts above water, using canoe-like boats as their only means of transportation. And on this day, one of the girls looked at me and said, I'm ready to go. And without hesitation, I said, let's go. And with that, we began going room to room, rescuing every girl in the brothel that was forced into sex slavery. And after some chaos, confusion, and even a few gunshots, they made it outside safe and physically free for the first time in years. I knew that this dream would one day mean so much more and I'm amazed to look back and see God's preparation in so many ways. Years before it was time for me to go. And time went on as it always does and I graduated from Vanguard in 2011 and deep down inside I didn't know what to do next. I knew that one day I would be a missionary, I just didn't know how or when. So I did what most people do when they don't know what to do and I continued to go to school. <laughs> So I started grad school that fall to get my master's in professional counseling. 
And classes were good. I enjoyed them. I was getting pushed out of my comfort zone. But God's calling was still a constant fire burning in my heart. And it, then it was November, and, and it was a night in life group discussing the provision of God. And it was the idea that provision accompanies purpose. I knew my purpose, but had never told anyone. And that night, I decided to tell my life group girls about the calling God placed on my life and the struggle that I was having about knowing when and what to do with it. I was in a waiting period. Now in my third quarter of grad school in February 2012, I experienced a week where nothing in my life felt right. It's hard to explain what I felt other than just complete unhappiness. I sat in my human development class, holding back tears from nowhere for three hours, unable to sleep at night, I would pray that God would help me. I had no idea what was happening internally that was affecting my daily life. And that Friday, I had the opportunity to attend a women's conference and got to hear Joyce Meyer speak. And among the many things she said that spoke to me that night, one thing I knew for sure was meant for me. And she said, if you're so un unhappy, ask God why. He will show you the root of the problem. All you have to do is ask. I knew what I needed to do. That night, lying in bed, unable to fall asleep, I asked God, why am I unhappy? And without a second's delay, God said, you're not listening to me. So I asked, what are you telling me? And he responded, I'm telling you to go. I knew instantly what he meant, and I knew instantly that my life was about to change. All the chaos, confusion, and unhappiness disappeared. And for the first time in weeks, the peace of God swept over me, and I knew that the Lord had ordered my steps. I told my friends and family all that God had revealed, withdrew from grad school, and began to make plans to go. As months progressed, the fire that God had ignited three years before burned without control for his children. I have to go, even if it means going alone. I cannot deny the call God has on my life. Man, that was a weak clap for that presentation. Can we do that again? Man. I feel so convicted, <laughs> but it was just, uh, it's awesome, Kayla. Thank you for inviting me to be a participate with you and share with you in the calling that God has placed upon your life. And, we are all here because we resonate with that and we're excited about that. I'm Tom, by the way, if you don't know. <laughs> and uh, it is just great to, to be here and hear about how God has a calling for each and every one of us, a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us, and only God has the capacity to work those things out. And as I started thinking about Kayla's call, and how it's always a, a risk, it's always a challenge whenever God calls us to be able to step out into the unknown. And the God that we serve is just the kind of God that, that likes to press our comfort zones. Anybody here found that out? He just likes to just get us past those comfort zones. And it's not always fun, but it's always interesting and awesome when we follow God. And I want to talk to you a little bit about calling and share with you some of the things that I have learned about calling in my ministry. And some of you know that I grew up in the great state of New York in Westchester County, beautiful Westchester County. On my mother's side, um, they all lived there. And my father's side, they all lived in the Bronx. And that they speak a little bit different on those two sides of the track. So all my cousins, they talk like this. And they, yo, Tommy, you still playing football? And I'm 50 years old. I, well, what's the matter for you? You know, you could still play. What's wrong with you? So those, those are my cousins. And I went up there for a funeral uh, not too long ago. And when you go to New York, you've got to understand the cultural sides of it, and one of which is the language in which you've got to talk. And so my cousins were schooling me in this. And they said, Tommy, there's two things you've got to know. Number, and by the way, 
They are the only ones that are allowed to call me Tommy. Just go ahead and let me just <laughs> square that up for you. So they said, there's two words you really, really got to know. First of all, it is forget about it. All right, guys, just say that. Forget about it. All right? Forget about it. Forget about it means it could mean anything. Forget about it could mean you're dead. It's over. Forget about it. Or forget about it means just blow it off. Or forget about it means off the charts. It's amazing. Okay? And the next one is how you doing. Now, how you doing is not a question. This is very important for you to understand this. They don't want to know how you're doing. It's just an acknowledgement that you exist, and I'm from New York, and I'm not going to kill you. It's okay. You're okay. How you doing? So you just, how you doing back? And so, um, you know, I remember we were, um, you know, going around kind of reminiscing in a neighborhood that I grew up in, or they grew up in, and they were talking about, you know, how they stuffed kids in drainage pipes, do you remember that? And how they blew up mailboxes and how all these deviant acts. And I'm sitting in the back and my cousin Billy says, Tommy, how you doing? And I said, forget about it, right? <laughs> Just forget about it. And I remember in those years, we grew up Catholic and I started hearing about God. Uh, it wasn't that I didn't believe in God. Um, I believed in him, and I knew that he was awesome. And it wasn't too long after that that I found myself at a Billy Graham crusade. And he started talking about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and this was new to me. Um, I didn't understand about the Bible. I didn't know about the Bible. But that idea of a personal relationship, something sparked in my heart. How many of you know the Bible tells us that you and I were called before the foundation of the world? And in that moment, in that time, the destiny on my life had to intersect with that meeting so that the Holy Spirit could spark something in my heart and start to pull on the calling of God. And it wasn't too long after that that I had a sixth grade teacher lead me to Christ. And when she led me to Christ, something significant happened in my heart. How many of you know what I'm talking about right now? I mean, it is undeniable. It is the, 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 the fire of God started to burn in my soul, in my heart. And as a young man in sixth grade, I started to sense what you're sensing. I started to sense what you had already sensed. And that is this fire and this passion. You remember the Satan statement, charging hell with a squirt gun. Man, I was dangerous. I'd go door to door, didn't know what I was doing in my neighborhood. Yo, Mr. Smith, I'm just telling you, you're going to hell. Have a good day. You know, you need Jesus, you know, and that was about it. it was, it's dangerous. But that's the calling of God. It starts in our life. And some of the things that I've learned about the calling is, first of all, Kayla, your calling is hot. I mean, you're hot. The husband thing will be no problem. Don't worry. Okay, that, that, God's got that. that. That's not a problem. But that's not what I'm talking about. The calling of God starts in a passion. And it is sustained in a passion. A passion for Jesus Christ. It's not about a position. It's not a, seminary is a wonderful thing. And, and education is a great thing. But we can be assured that we all have a calling from God. Because we've got a passion for Jesus Christ. Because it is not my head knowledge that this world is looking for. It's the heart change that a passion for Christ can only bring into a, a human heart. And so it's, it's fueled by passion. It's ignited by passion. And the passion that you've got for Jesus Christ is securing your calling in God. There's two ways that I believe that you receive that passion, that stirs that passion in, in, inside of us. The first one is love. But Kayla, we don't love God in a self-generated way. The way our passion grows is not by being lovers of God, it's receiving love. And your capacity to receive love will ignite your heart. And 
what the people that you're going to are looking for is a burning heart, something tra transformed in your heart. It comes through your eyes. It comes through your language. It's going to come through your hands. It's going to come through whatever duties that they give you. But that is the calling of God. It, it, it will come as you continue to receive the love of God. I want to admonish you in that. You are here tonight because your heart was ignited by the love of God. And that same love is going to sustain you in this calling. It, I promise you, God will place that love where he needs to place it in the nations of the world. So first and foremost, keep that burning, the love of God. I think the next way the love of God continues, the passion of God continues to grow in our heart, flat out, is the presence of the Holy Spirit. In my ministry, I started to serve God, and I was in between football tryouts. And uh, NFL for me stood for not for long. That's what that meant for me. And so in between that season of my life, I became a youth pastor. And it was, was shortly after that, my heart got filled, baptized with the Holy Spirit. And when my heart was baptized with the Holy Spirit, something significant changed in my calling. Something that I cannot explain. I'd go downtown, and I, didn't, I still had no idea what I was doing. And that's probably the theme of my calling. I got no idea of what I was doing, am doing. And I went downtown to downtown Charlotte. It was all African Americans in the gym. I was the only white guy in there. And I'd play basketball with those guys. And back then, I was a little bigger. And I'd say, all right, now we're going to have a Bible study. And they were like, okay, we're going to have a Bible study. And they'd stay, and these guys would start getting saved. And they come to Christ, and I'm tripping over my words, and they're coming to Christ. But I started to realize it's not by might, it's not by my power, but it's by the Spirit of the living God that is going to push my calling forward. A relationship with the Holy Spirit, that's going to keep it hot. So I encourage you to keep the relationship with the Spirit of the living God moving in your life, because it's going to empower that calling on your life. It's a powerful thing. The second thing I'd share with you is not only is the calling hot, but whoever God calls, he qualifies. He qualifies. And I think that this is a very important point for us to know. Because understanding that you are qualified, qualification will always produce confidence. When God qualifies you, even though man, many times, man most of the time, will disqualify you. Something secure in your heart has to be able to say, but wait a second, man didn't call me, God called me, my calling was found in God, so therefore I am going to go, I am going to fulfill this, I am going to speak, I am going to talk, because it was God that called me, and it was God that qualifies me. For those of you that have been functioning in ministry, how many of you have faced some daunting tasks where you felt unqualified? But deep down, you had to say, you know, wait a second, this, this, this isn't about me. God called me. God put this on my life. And now my calling is his problem because he qualified me. Have you ever read the story Chasing the Dragons, the book Chasing the Dragons by Jackie Pullinger? I encourage you to get that book. You are a modern day Jackie Pullinger. It's one of the most inspirational. Katie, have you read that? It's one of the most inspirational mission books that there are. A young girl um, had a call similar to you, didn't know how she was going to get there, put herself through school. Now at 21 years old, she had a passion to go to Asia. But back then, they would not take you unless you had a missionary sending institution. And she went to countless of every possible missionary sending institution. She went through all the motions, everything they asked her to do. And time after time after time, they disqualified her. I'm sorry you're too young. You don't have enough of experience. You're a lady. You're a girl. You can't go to the places that you want to go. And for two years straight, she could not get anybody to believe in her calling. Jackie Pullinger knew she was called of God. And because God called her, he qualified her, she had confidence. She gathered together the money that she had and she bought a one-way ticket to Hong Kong, no turning back. And that was the only money that she had in her pocket. Jackie Pullinger went into the walled city 
of Hong Kong. It was the most notorious place in Asia at that time. Literally, it is a wall city of buildings. And it was there in the walled city that the triad uh, gang was so notorious, and opium gangs, and people murdered on a regular, regular basis. It was one of the, considered one of the most dangerous places in the world, and she got a teaching job right in the middle of it. And Jackie Pullinger started to pierce those gangs and started to lead those gangs to Christ through her love and she literally saw a transformation and the miracles that happen through her ministry are countless and that ministry is still going on today it started back in 1966 because a little girl said you might not have called me but God called me and I am not going to go back on that call when he qualifies you whoever God calls he qualifies here's the third thing and I think it's the last thing that I'm going to share with you um, when God calls us and, and places a calling on our life, God always cares for those he calls. Does that make sense to you? I promise you. He will care for every single solitary need that you have. Because your calling in God does not come because he's testing your commitment. Your calling in God comes from one place, his goodness. And just like if he called a pastor to Scottsdale, and that's good for him, he will call a young lady to Asia because that is good for her, because it's what's tucked in her heart. The God that you serve is big and he's good. And he wants to show the people that you're called to that he is good, that he is provider, that he will take care of your needs, that he will make a way where there's absolutely no way. I think that one of the names of God should be Jehovah Nick of Time because he comes through just in the nick of time. I found that out by how many of you have found that out? Just in the nick of time. You're like, God, are you up there any place? Just in the nick of time, he will come through because he's gonna care for you. He's gonna care for your need. And because you're taking care of his house, because you're taking care of his people, I prophesy he is gonna take care of your house and he's gonna take care of your people. When I was writing this out for you, Kayla, the word that I got was God is gonna cause you to laugh at the blessing of the Lord. You will laugh at the blessing of the Lord. Sarah had two laughs. The first laugh that she had was because she couldn't see how God was going to do this through her. The second laugh was she was overtaken by the blessing of God. And you're getting the second laugh. And you're going to be overtaken with the blessing of God. I don't know how much money is going to be raised here tonight, but you're going to have more than enough. And what I want you to know is that God will always, always provide for you more than enough in your calling. And it's exciting to see it. And so you have challenged us and we're going to follow in your footsteps as you lay it all on the line for Jesus Christ. We can do that as businessmen. We can do it as pastors. We can do it as old youth pastors. We can do it wherever God has called us to. And I believe that as you follow your call, Kayla, this is what's going to happen. God's going to look over heaven and he's going to say, Jesus, how's my girl doing? And Jesus is going to say, forget about it. <laughs> Just forget about it. She's knocking it out of the park. Amen. So we encourage you in your calling, Kayla. We're excited for it. And I know you can be secured that God's going to take care of every single need because of that calling. Can I pray for you? Yeah, come on up here. Amen. How many of you just love this girl? I, you know what? Kevin, you did what I did you married beyond yourself right that's what i did and that just shows how wise we are and that god loves us and the halo that your mom has around her head i see around your head it's an amazing thing how that that happens and so god we just extend your hands out towards kayla right now and um i want you guys kevin why don't you come and lay your hands on your daughter if you guys would come and just daughter and sister and let's just lay our hands on her and you guys why don't we stand up and just pray and pray the blessing of the Lord over this trip and we're gonna dispatch angels and we're just gonna declare what God has said over this young lady 
And Father, I, I want to thank you that Kayla was called before the foundation of the world and you are her father and you are her God. And we acknowledge before heaven and earth this day, this calling. Lord, I see it like a David call. Lord, David was not more powerful than the mighty men. Matter of fact, he was less powerful than them. He was not wiser than the sons of Issachar. He probably was not as wise. The only thing that set David apart was his heart and his calling. Father, she has got a heart like David. One Father God that is passionate, but one that is a warrior. One that is tender, but that one that is willing to, to have a hardened forehead and speak the truth in love. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless her this day. And we ask you that you would shroud her, that you would surround her all the days of her life with the favor of the Lord. I prophesy over her Psalms 91. And that, Lord, that uh, in the this secret place of her calling in you, that tender place, that place, Father God, that you have whispered to her, that you have spoken to her, that, Father, you have shown her things. Lord, that tender place where she journals out of and she writes in that journal and and talks about you and talks about things father in that place where only you know the deepest hopes of her heart Lord, out of that place comes protection. I decree it. Out of that place comes provision. I declare it. Out of that place, Father, in you comes you going before her and being her rear guard. I pray, Father, no pestilence, no sickness, no disease is able to touch her in the name of Jesus. According to Isaiah chapter 54, I declare this day that no weapon formed against her is able to prosper in the name of Jesus. And every fiery dart and assignment that the enemy would try and send against her in the name of Jesus Christ. We, we squelch those by faith in Jesus' name. And I get the word handmaiden, that you are his handmaiden, that God has drawn you and he has pulled you along his side and you and him will, will set many, many free. And the, the, the fire and the passion that God starts in you and continues to grow into you to this day is going to continue to grow. And that fire and that passion and that love is going to grow and you are going to liberate many, even as the God goes before you. And the handmaiden of the Lord, God says to you that I've got your appointments. I have got your placements. I have got everything that you need. I will give you my life. I will give you my godliness. I will give you my presence because you have opened wide your mouth. And I hear the word pleasing that the pleasure of the Lord falls upon you. And he shines upon you and his face shines upon you for your heavenly father. Your Lord is pleased with you. And he is taking care of everything that concerns you. He is molding the one that will walk with you. He is, he is forming the family. He is taking care of the ministry. He is going to take care of divine appointments that you don't even know about. And there are going to be divine connections that God has for you. And you will have a connection into the business community because you're going to touch a young person. You're going to touch somebody that has a connection and a father that is well able to fund something that's not even, that, that is already in your heart, but it's not on your grid yet but God's going to pull it out. And the Lord says that he has formed you in unlikely soil, just like he did John the Baptist, because he needed you not to be an echo. He needed to give you your voice. And now the Lord says that he has given you your voice. This cry for justice is his cry. And out of that will come on opportunities. Many opportunities will come and you will stand even before magistrates and people of influence. And they will see the grace of God upon you. And they will open, I will open up doors for you that no one will be able to shut all the days of your life all the days of your life and because you have committed your life to me your life will be glorious your life will be filled filled with wonder filled with signs for you are my daughter my precious one and I am well pleased with you I am well pleased with you and so father we bless her this day Father, we place our hands upon her and we just pray your increased anointing over her life. And now, God, we call the funds in from the north, from the south, from the east and from the west. Father, that the godly would be blessed in their giving, that the ungodly 
would be convicted and give. Father, I'm asking you that a man that does not yet know you would hear the heart cry and write a check that will take care of four years of ministry for her. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to unleash that now and that out of that four years of ministry, this man would bow his knees to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the name of Jesus. And God, we pull off the lid. And Kayla, I speak over you. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Surely all things are possible. All things are possible. So do not limit him. All things are possible. We bless you this day. And we thank you this day, God, for what you're doing in her life. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 That's awesome. I want to pray one more thing over you. I'm sorry. Father, I pray that anything prophetic that you have placed in my life, I am asking you, I lay my hands upon this servant of God, and I pray that you would give her a double portion in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray a prophetic anointing upon her now in the name of Jesus Christ, that she would be aware of happenings before they happen in the name of Jesus. That she, that, that I prophesy, Father God, that she will know past paths to walk down and paths not to walk down. She will, Father, know doors to knock on and doors not to knock on. I pray discernment in her and I pray a supernatural gifting of it in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we just stir the gifts of the Holy Spirit right now that she would have words of wisdom and words of knowledge and words of understanding in the name of Jesus. So, Father, we speak over her that she will have an apt word in due season in the right moment in the right time in the name of Jesus I lay my hands upon her and impart to her father prophetic gifting in the mighty name of Jesus Christ yes. by faith amen 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 awesome thank you Kevin you can all have a seat I want to thank Pastor Tom um, for sharing that and for ministering to Kayla um, for everyone who doesn't know, Pastor Tom is one of the executive pastors here at City of Grace. <laughs> I didn't tell you that before, but most of you know that. <laughs> you know, now comes the point that is probably the most difficult thing sometimes to talk about, and that's money. Um, Kayla's already raised $2,500 from two individuals, and that's just, uh, that's a blessing. That's a miracle that two people came forward. One person came forward with a $1,000 gift. And another person came forward to pay for her um, round trip airfare, and that's about $1,500. And so I, I just want to say that God, without a doubt, God is going to supply Kayla's needs. Um, there is no doubt. And I just want to encourage you tonight. I'm not going to plead with you because God is her provider, and God is your provider. And I just want to echo what Kayla said about Paul when he addressed the church in Philippi. My God shall supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. That promise was made to people who helped Paul in his time of need. And many times we help people in their time of need and we don't necessarily realize that there's a promise linked to that. And that is that, is that God will supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And that's made to people who supplied the need, supplied the answer to pe for people who were in ministry taking the gospel to others. And I want to encourage you tonight whether you're able to give $100 or whether you're able to give multiplied beyond that, my God shall supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. There's an envelope and a form um, for you um, there on your table. You can make a one-time gift. You can make a monthly gift. You can do both. It's your, it's, your, it's your choice as the Holy Spirit leads you and as God guides you. And I want to encourage you. God will supply your need. Some of you can give a small amount and others can give a large amount. And it's not so much that everybody gives the same thing. It's just that we give out of what we have been given. If God has given you much, then in return you can give back much. And if God has given you little at this point in your life, Lavelle and I have been there and we know what that's like as well. 
And we just encourage you tonight to be faithful just as what God has given you. I want to pray just real quickly um, as you make um, this decision and this donation. Lord, I thank you for each person who here is here tonight. And I don't want to coerce anyone into giving, but I want you, Holy Spirit, just to speak to the hearts of individuals. And Lord, you know what each person is able to give. You know what you want them to give. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to them, that they would be obedient. And more than anything, Lord, I pray that you would supply all their needs. I pray that you would give back to them, pressed down, shaken together, and running out all over, Lord, to them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We want to thank you for coming tonight. And after you fill that out, um, if you're able to give, just if you're not able to give, regardless of what you have, fill out the information because Kayla wants to add you to her um, newsletter, mailing list on the internet, things like that. And as you leave tonight, and you don't have to leave immediately, um, get another Orion Moon Pie. They're the favorite of all of Asia. Seriously. Um, there's a backpack on the left side as you leave. Drop it in the top of the backpack. Um, that backpack is all that Kayla is allowed to take for six months. So, um, and that includes her, that also includes her um, sleeping bag. And if you're making out a check, <laughs> make it out to Lionheart 117. The 501c3 is in process and should be completed within a matter of a few months. So, um, Yes, it's submitted. So you can, they'll totally get a tax yeah, you'll get a tax deduction. Um, the way the glorious IRS works is that if they're slow, they, may, they don't do it for our benefit, they do it for their benefit. It's 18 months retroactive. So no matter what, tax, it's tax deductible 18 months retroactively to the point that um, Kayla has applied. So it, at, So it will be tax deductible. We have someone good working on it who's done it quite a few times. Any questions? Wonderful. Yes, Maggie. About the monthly commitment, where do you want us to put our information? Like for those things? There's two ways to give monthly. Um, you can send a check in monthly, or we're going to be setting, and I should tell you this, um, Kayla is setting up online giving through authorize.net, which is a merchant service with the bank. And so, you know, it won't be PayPal, which is kind of, you know, substandard. Because <laughs> I, I deal with PayPal all the time, and it's a struggle. This is going to be with authorized.net, and it will be with the bank, and it will actually, so there's two ways to do that. So you can just provide your information, and then um, we'll set up a system, Kayla will set up a system so that you get a reminder, and you can either send a check or you can do it online. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for coming. We bless you. We pray that God will pour out his riches upon your life. Thanks for coming. If you have questions for, oh. if you have questions for Kayla, Candace has just instructed me. That's the, Candace is the older daughter. Candace has instructed me to let you know that if you have questions for Kayla, the younger daughter, that she'll be happy to answer them. You can just come up and talk to her. <laughs>